All right, hello everyone. My name is Sonia Suckup, and I am a licensed mental health practitioner here at ESC Wait. And I have been asked to present to you on early childhood mental health. Um, this is a topic that I am very passionate about. And um, at the end of the presentation, I will make sure that you all have copies of the presentation as well as the resources that I discussed throughout the presentation. Um, you will also have my contact information at the very end. So should you have questions or want to reach out, please feel free to contact me. All right, let's get started. So throughout the presentation, I'd like to cover what is mental health in young children, as this looks a little bit different in children than it does in adults. We'll talk about the prevalence of mental health in young children. And then we'll also discuss strategies to support social and emotional development in children, as this is really something that we want to be looking at and considering when we're talking about supporting mental health in young children. So originally, this presentation was designed um, to be done at a preschool workshop day, and um, I wanted to know what you wanted to know that day. Um, but I still want to know, so if you have questions about something or you have ideas about something that aren't addressed in my presentation today, please feel free to reach out to me as I love getting feedback and hearing from you all. So why am I the person to talk to you about this? Well, um, for starters, I have six years of clinical experience working with children and families. Um, I started my internship working with children and families, and to this day, I still feel like it is the best fit for me, and I enjoy it tremendously. Um, I did spend a year working with adults with alcohol and addiction issues, and this was really helpful in helping me identify and learn more about family systems and also learn more about this idea that when things don't go well early on, they tend to not go well later on. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, I also have six years of early childhood consultative work experience. So I've done early childhood mental health consultation with NENCAP. I've done it with the uh, Nebraska Department of Ed. Um, oftentimes it would happen in my work as a clinical therapist. Um, and then also, I feel like currently, this is something that I can offer to all of the schools that we support in ESU8. I'm also a pyramid model trainer and coach. So if you're not familiar with a pyramid model, it is a high fidelity model to support social and emotional learning um, for classrooms in, uh, in preschool. So this is something that I feel very strongly about. And a lot of my resources that I talk about today come from the pyramid model. Additionally, I am a circle of security parent uh, facilitator. This is a, um, I guess you can call it a training, but really it's a reflection model that is uh, supportive of parents and caregivers to help take a deeper look at how to meet the needs of children. I am trained in providing EMDR. It's a type of therapy that is specific to supporting individuals who've experienced trauma. And I find this to be particularly helpful in my work with children as this has given me a better lens to be able to understand how um, kids process and interpret trauma, um, as this could be a big factor when we're talking about mental health. And finally, I have experience in play therapy, which um, I believe it's very important that when children are presented with challenges, we're offering them a modality to be able to communicate with us in a way that makes most sense to them. And children are meant to play. And so it makes most sense that if we're trying to support children through something, they have an opportunity to use tools that they're familiar with. So within this time, I now know for certain that... Um, when things go well in those early years, things tend to go well later on. And when things don't go well early, they tend not to go well later on, if intervention is not offered, um, which is why I firmly believe that inter early intervention is so vitally important. Okay, so what is early childhood mental health? This definition is provided by the Center on the Developing Child from Harvard, 
And I like this definition because not only does it discuss the developing brain as a foundation for mental health, but also includes this idea that environments and relationships and experiences shape mental health. It also speaks to this idea that these early experiences, if they tend not to go well, could create problems later on. So this is a video also offered by Harvard that talks about early childhood mental health that I'd like to watch with you all, and we'll have a discussion afterwards about some concepts identified in the video. What do we want for our children? What's our goal? Our goal is to have productive citizens that are going to be part of a thriving communities. So how do we get from here to there? As we grow up, and as we move into becoming functioning members of society, our mental health is an important part of how we perform our responsibilities as adults. Mental health can't be separated out from cognitive development and language development and kind of social competence, and they all have their roots early on in either a very sturdy or a weak foundation. We certainly know that infants and very young children can exhibit behaviors, emotional behaviors, motor behaviors, which are predictive in certain cases of subsequent mental illness. What are the early signs of mental health problems? I think that when people look at children and think about mental health problems that they have in mind often is the kinds of mental health problems that we see in adults. They're looking to see the equivalent of a depressed adult in a child or the equivalent of a schizophrenic adult in a child. And I think that because of the nature of development that when children have mental health problems, they just look different. Some of the early signs of greater risk for mental health problems are usually not called mental health problems by people. They're usually called you know, things like um, behavior problems or a child who has difficulty controlling his emotions. Some of these may be early signs of what might be a mental health problem later and some of which may be just differences among perfectly healthy children. So what does good mental health look like in a child? Good mental health looks like a child who's curious and interested in, in the world and wants to learn and can sit and reflect at times about what's going on. It's the ability to experience love, affection, emotions, get upset when things are upsetting, and bring yourself back into levelness without needing intense intervention. How do mental health impairments develop in early childhood? 21st century science at the molecular level is very clear that all aspects of brain function are the result of an interaction between genetics and experience. Mental illness, as most people think about it, is a very heavy genetic component. Um, mental health, behavior, personality, um, also has a genetic component, um, but it's much more malleable in the face of, of environmental influences. Genes and experiences, as far as nature is concerned, are just different ways of setting up operating systems, brain systems, neurons. What happens when a child experiences what we call toxic stress? Severe experiences that can be damaging to its developing architecture. Those toxic experiences essentially create this unstable environment, this unstable foundation if sound mental health provides a foundation of stability for a child's development, mental health problems can be thought of like a wobbly table. With a child or a table, there may be many reasons for instability. Identifying which factor is causing instability is the first step towards solving the problem. So how do we restore stability to a child's mental health? But we can detect the early signs of instability recognizing what these signs are provides a child with the opportunity then to be placed with healthcare professionals who are trained 
to develop a more balanced set of skills on the emotional control side. The prescription is to provide support for parents and in that environment in order to reduce conflict. And that, in turn, will lead to a reduction in dysregulated behavior uh, in the infant and young child. Most potential mental health problems will not become mental health problems if we respond to them early. Providing the right kinds of supports and intervention early on will reduce the extent to which this will be a potentially more serious problem later. All right, so two factors that were really highlighted in the video, we're talking about genetics, what are you hardwired biologically for, and experience, what, what has happened in your life, what have, you, what have you come in contact with? And I found this to be a very important thing to reflect on when we do have these little people that we are engaging and interacting with, and we most commonly see the behavior. We aren't able to see the genetic components and also experience that they have outside of the school. So keep in mind that these two factors both have an equal play in when we start talking about serious mental health conditions um, in children. Another thing that was discussed in the video that I want to highlight is that with early intervention, oftentimes mental health issues that could be present um, can also be treated very effectively. Um, they mentioned how children are oftentimes very malleable, meaning that if the genetics are there, again, we cannot change those, but if the child has an experience that we, we can, in a sense, help make sense of or organize for that child, um, the brain is very malleable and can, can recover and repair from whatever that experience might have been that was, that was negative or resulted in mental health issues. So this also, um, from good old WebMD, um, suggests that a combination of factors including um, heredity, biology, psychological trauma, and environmental stress may be involved. So again, we must consider all of these factors when considering a child is struggling, how do we go about supporting them? And a very big factor that we have to take a look at is oftentimes children get support through relationship. Relationship for children who are very young um, is really the medicine oftentimes that children will need to help um, help repair or help prevent these mental health conditions from worsening. So early childhood mental health is also the optimal growth in social, emotional, behavioral, and cognitive development of the young child in the context of unfolding relationship between parent and child. We have to remember that as the brain is growing and adapting and learning, the people who are most responsible for that growing brain are oftentimes a child's parents or caregivers. And the relationship is what supports the unfolding and growth of brain development. So this definition comes from a report um, from the Early Childhood Mental Health um, in Nebraska that was in 2002. And I like this idea because, again, we go back to um, the vulnerability that children are often in requires a sense of responsible relationship with a caring, loving, and supportive caregiver. So it's not just pathology. When we're talking about ch um, childhood mental health, early childhood mental health, it's not pathology. We're not taking a look at giving these children a diagnosis right away. It is what are the factors what are the key players, and what experience is this child having that could be, could be 
um, leading to some of these issues to be present. So in all of these definitions, we look at social and emotional development. It's really the developmental process of children being able to experience, regulate, and express their emotions. I can have a feeling, actually feel it, know what to do with it, and let others know about it. I can also form close, secure relationships with others. The key word being secure, meaning safe, predictable, okay. Um, the ability to explore the environment and learn. Being aware, having a, a felt sense of comfort and knowing more about my environment. And know that this can include family, community, and cultural expectations. We must not forget that cultural expectations are a huge part of children growing up and their experiences. Again, going back to genetics and experience both being key factors in early childhood mental health. So here I have listed some of the most common mental health conditions um, that are actually diagnosed in children. And again, a diagnosis must come from a, um, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a licensed mental health clinician. Um, it's not something that is given by a parent or a relative or because one person just has a idea, then we can start calling it that. Anxiety and depression um, and ADHD are the most common diagnosis that I see in children that I work with. But I would like to also recognize that ADHD oftentimes looks a lot like children who've experienced trauma. Their focus, their attention, their ability to regulate their emotions is really is really made difficult due to their traumatic experience. So for some children that present with symptoms that look like ADHD, it could in fact actually be trauma related. I also put on here at the bottom attachment. So again, thinking back, early childhood mental health is also the child growing in, in the sense in, of relationship between parent and child. So a child must know that the support is there, the love is there, that the needs can be met. And with that, we have a secure attachment. That child doesn't have to worry about having or not having. So when considering mental health conditions in children, attachment is also something that is always assessed for specifically by me um, and should be considered um, a factor in um, the experience of the child. What relationships has this child been in that promote or may present an opportunity for a mental health condition to, to exist. So here's a bit about prevalence. So one in six children in the U.S. age two to eight years old um, has a diagnosed mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. So if we look at that, one in six, that is so very common. Um, boys are more likely to be diagnosed than girls. And among children living 100% below the poverty level, that drops to one in five children. So these statistics come directly from the CDC. And um, they're, they're pretty good about collecting um, up-to-date data. Um, with what I see in, in schools and classrooms, um, this data seems to be pretty accurate. So thinking about this, one in six children and your classroom sizes... Take that into consideration when you're engaging with children, and again, because 
children present different in their mental health uh, needs, it often presents as behavior. So if you are seeing children in your class that are exhibiting problematic behavior, we could be looking at a child with some mental health concerns. Not saying that is, that is exactly 100% correct, if you see a behavior that there's a mental health concern, but it is possible. So what does mental health look like in children then? Well, my short answer to this is it can look like a lot of different things. But because I know people like to have a general idea, um, here is a list of things that it could look like. Oftentimes when I'm asked to engage with a child or do some consultation, um, I start asking questions about their experience. What do we know? What do we see? What do we hear? What is happening? And then I also do my best to assess for um, what is home like? What, what are relationships like? Not just with parents, but with teachers and peers as well. Because those, those are all things that can lead to clues as to the context of relationship, genetics, and experience. So I got this list from the CDC um, that are risk factors for children developing um, mental health conditions. This list is overwhelming, and this list also, um, it just seems like a lot. But as you read through it, it makes sense. Because again, if we're talking about vulnerability, we're talking about connection or relationship in context with a parent, and we're talking about environments and experiences, all of these things are included in that. I also wanted to include a list of protective factors. So you can see here that there are that are more than half that are highlighted. And I pose to you that these are all things that children are able to obtain in preschool. Social networks, becoming a member of a class, having a teacher, having people to engage with and interact with on a consistent basis, a social network. Concrete support for basic needs. This is a toughie. This one has come across my, uh, my email and, and in person so many times this year of this child needs things that he or she may not be getting at home. And school is a place where some of those things can be offered, like meals and warmth and connection. So nurturing parenting skills. I know that everyone has parent-teacher conferences. I know that information can be sent home. I know that you have a platform to be able to share information with families in a non-confrontational way. Later on, I'll show you a resource called the, Back the Backpack Series, and they're just one-page handouts that talk about specific skills to, um, to help build in children. And those are opportunities to, to send information to support nurturing parenting skills for the children at home. Stable family relationships. Oftentimes, um, children come into preschool that you know that have siblings. Oftentimes, you will catch children calling you mom or dad. All the time because in the context of relationship they trust you you support them you meet their needs it seems a bit more to them you offer rules and expectations throughout your entire day you have school nurses possibly some social social services at your school you are those caring adults outside of the family. Every single day they come into your classroom, you are being a role model for them. And I know this because 
I work with little people all the time that want to play school and they want to be the teacher. And um, I think that's something really special. And then the last thing, just communities that can support parents, rallying behind families to help them get what they need also. Not turning a blind eye, not deciding whether or not I have to report it, but really supporting parents and families and getting what they need for that child as well. So I wanted to mention this just to plant the seeds of getting you curious about this idea of genetics versus experience. So there's a documentary out there called Three Identical Strangers. Um, I think it's on um, Hulu or Prime. I know it's on one of them. And it's about three, tri three triplets that were born and taken to an orphanage. And this orphanage adopted these three children out to three different families. Now, of course, ethically, how could they do this? This has come into question, and it has come out that um, this orphanage was doing research that, of course, at the time would have been very unethical, but they were doing it anyway. So these three children, Tim, Edward, and David, they were all adopted by different families, and these families, they didn't know that, that these boys had siblings. So Tim was adopted to a working middle-class family, Edward was adopted to a middle-class family, and David was adopted by an upper-middle-class family. And to just provide you some insight of the dynamics, um, Edward, he did not get along with his father. They would fight a lot, and they just did not see eye-to-eye. -eye. Um, David, he had a very absent father, as his father was a doctor, and he just wasn't home very much. And then Tim had a very involved father, um, he spent a lot of time with Tim, and he was a grocer. So I kind of have to spoil the plot to tell you more about this. Um, but the three boys end up finding one another. And they find out that they're all wrestlers. They liked the same colors. They smoked the same brand of cigarettes. And they'd each had an adopted sister around the same age. So from their perspective... It made sense that they were related. They, they had a lot of the same things. They had similar personality traits. But here's where it gets interesting. As these men continued to grow, Edward began to develop an erratic behavior about himself. He was unpredictable and at times manic depressive. Um... They theorized that their biological mother was possibly diagnosed with severe and persistent mental health illness. They don't, they don't know if it was schizophrenia or bipolar, but they, they theorized that it was possible that she had a very severe mental health illness. David and Tim, they were just better prepared to cope with life. They still struggled. They still, they still had some um, areas and times of their life where it got really hard. But Edward, he seemed to really have a tough time being able to cope in life. So at the very end, they pose this question about nature and nurture. And I think they leave you with a general consensus that it's both. There's a huge genetic component to who we are, but it's our experience that also helps continue to shape and make sense of our world. So incredibly fascinating documentary. Check it out. Um, it was really good. Okay. So um, since I am not presenting to you in person, um, I was going to offer a break when we did this, but we're just going to keep going here. So how can I help? How, how can you all be aware and what are things that you can be doing in your classrooms every day um, to either support children with possible mental health issues or, or even help be curious about, is this a mental health issue? Um, so I pose that early intervention matters. And we know this because of the research and the outcomes that say the earlier that we can support these children, the better off 
they are because again, they are so malleable. Their brains are so malleable and so highly able to repair. We also know that safe, loving connections help children in the development of these negative, whether it be genetics or experiences. Um, And lastly, we understand that you matter to these children, that you are a safe person that they are coming to every day that are going to help navigate and help guide um, how their lives can be better for them. So um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Bruce Perry. He is a, um, a neuroscientist that helped us understand truly the impacts of, of brain development um, with children who've experienced trauma. Um, and he posed this in a, in a presentation one time that I just absolutely loved, which is that people, not programs, change people. The effective agents of change in any successful program, project, or system are human beings. Oftentimes, when I when I first meet with teachers and we start discussing problematic um, issues that children are presenting with, um, I sense the fear, the fear that teachers have, and it's fear of doing the wrong thing or the fear of not knowing what to do. And what I would tell you is. You matter to these children, and you just being a safe person and and posing these really difficult questions is such a gift to them. So I don't want you to worry about about not knowing what to do or not knowing what to come next. Um, Let's create a team and figure that out together. It doesn't have to be on you, but know that people, not programs, change people. I love that. So the first thing, this foundation, this the most critical and important foundation that all children need is safe, loving, caring relationship. In that circle of security um, training that I that I talked to you about before, um, it's posed that if children can understand that they've been picked and they've been chosen and that they are loved, they'll be okay because they need to know those three things. And I would also suppose that all human beings need to know those three things exist. And when we don't, things start to go badly. So here I have a picture. It's called the emotional cup. So I want you to visualize that every human being in the world has an emotional cup. And when it's full, we're good. And when it's empty, We are not. So this talks about what what fills a child's cup. Play, friendship, one-on-one time, love, affection, connection, succeeding, doing what they love to do. I would pose that the same exists for me as a grown-up. And what empties the cup? Stress, strain, Rejection by peers, loneliness, isolation, yelling, punishment, failure, fatigue, doing what they're forced to do. And our goal is to always have a balanced cup. How do we feel when our cup is half full? We can get through the day. We can do what we need to do. But maybe we don't have a pep in our step. Maybe maybe we're not giving off the vibe that Anybody can come to me. One thing I want you to consider are the cups of the children in your classroom. Look at the side that says what fills a child's cup. Almost all of those things require relationship. Safe, loving connection. Just consider that. All right. Now, when children don't know, again, if children are presenting with with challenges or behaviors, I strongly believe that when children don't know what to do, we have to teach them. They don't have this experience or templates to know how to navigate. We must teach. Oftentimes, these boil down to skills 
learn new behavior, and learn new concepts. But again, going back to what I had said before, children must know these three things. I have been picked, I have been chosen, and I am loved. I want you to think for a moment, how did those three questions play out in your classrooms? So for instance, I have been picked. Does this child have a desk with their name on it? Does this child have a spot for their, for their um, boots to go at the end of recess? They have been chosen. Are there plenty of opportunities throughout the day that they get to be cho chosen? They are interacting. They are a part of a group. They are the preschool classroom. And finally, I am loved. How do we communicate to these little people that we love them? We're going to segue into something for a moment here. So we oftentimes don't talk about love in education other than we love our jobs. So let's talk about John Gottman's love research. If you're not familiar, John Gottman is a um, a renowned therapist who does a lot of work with couples. And he created something called the Love Lab. This was his research. And what he found that if a couple came into his Love Lab, he could predict with up to 94% certainty whether couples, stray, straight, gay, rich, poor, childless or not, whether they would end up together or not. And then he also kind of provides the statement that also a small number of marriages, they're just doomed from the beginning. <laughs> Seems morbid, but I guess that's what he, he found to be true. So what was the factor? What was, what was it that he found that could be the predictor? Bids for connection. Turning towards one another in simple, everyday interactions bids for connection. I'm going to challenge you all. Instead of saying attention in your classrooms, that child is just looking for attention or those are attention type behaviors, I want you to replace that with connection because that is essentially what it is. I am needing to know that I am loved. So these bids for connection, they can be a question, a statement, eye contact, touch. Bids for connection in children are quite obvious. They turn to you, they look at you, they grab your hand, they ask you to play. Sometimes bids for connection are not so nice. Kids might kick, they might scream, they might blurt, they might be inappropriate. When you turn toward those bid for connection, people hear, I'm interested in you. I hear you. I understand you. I'm on your side. I'd like to help you. I'd like you to be with me. I'd like to be with you. I accept you. When children are in your classroom and offer bids for connection, this is what they're looking for. We must not forget that every single day, children everywhere are offering bids for connection. They just want to be loved. Again, we don't talk about love and education, but with little children, and when we're talking about the importance of context and relationship, we have to have a conversation about love. When kids struggle, when kids don't struggle, they offer bids for connection. And I challenge you all, to not only look for what those bids are, but also meet them. Instead of saying a child is just attention seeking, we can say that child is looking for connection and how can I meet that connection? How can I help? How can I help that child feel like they are loved in my classroom? All right, so here, here comes um, my pyramid background. 
And I'll do my best to explain each of these interventions and how it supports um, positive mental health growth in children. So again, keep in mind, when kids don't know, we have to teach them. We have to teach them a different way. We have to teach them a new skill. We may have to walk with them in every step of that new process, but we have to teach them. So first things first, routine. Routine in the classroom demonstrates a sense of predictability. When children know what's going to come next, it inherently calms things down. Think about yourselves. When you know what your day is going to look like, it provides a sense of safety. It provides a sense of certainty. In the classroom with little people, a routine is very, very important. Another thing that is important to, to consider is little people oftentimes aren't the best at reading or recognizing letters yet, but they are incredibly visual. So if we can have a picture schedule of what their day is going to look like, they can connect much better about what's going to happen and what's going to happen next. Another thing this is very important to consider is that this picture schedule must be at their height level. Because if they're going about their day and they need to know what comes next, their first instinct isn't going to be to look up. It's going to be to look around. So in having a picture schedule, we can help them connect things easier, but also having it at their height so that they can actually see this. One thing important about routine is if changes are going to occur, or if we know that something is going to be different, we have to prepare children for that. They need to know what's going to be different about their day. It helps them feel in control. It helps them know what's coming next. And it helps prevent any type of anxiety or uncertainty about what their day is going to bring. So for example, say we're going on a field trip. All right, we review the schedule. And instead of going to recess, we are going to go on a field trip today. This is where we're going. These are the people that are going to be there. This is how we're going to get there. Preparation is key in helping children understand changes. For children that require extra support, this must be given. If you have a child who you know is already having a hard time with changes, maybe we give them a little bit more. We give them a picture schedule for what that, um, that difference is going to be. We give them the steps of what the field trip is going to look like. And again, with the routine, every child must have a spot, a name tag, a place for their book bag, responding to that need I must be picked. They have a spot in the classroom. So here's an example of what a picture schedule can look like. And again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can take a lot of work and it can take as little work. If this is something that you don't have and would like, please let me know. And I would love to assist you in this process. So because I believe in parallel process, I would like you to focus your attention to us. We use planners. We use notifications in our phones. We have some system, lesson plans, of helping us know what we're doing for the day. Think for a moment what you would feel like if all of a sudden those things disappeared. I know for myself, I would feel very panicked, very anxious, and a little bit all over the place. It's no different for children. They need to know what their day is going to be and they need to know what's coming next. It helps them prepare and organize. And this ability to know what's coming next can help reduce anxiety, it can help reduce frustration, 
It can help even reduce the excitement that comes with anticipation. Now we're going to move on to rules. So um, in my clinical work with parents, oftentimes I would have a conversation about the fact that kids need rules. The rules are not there to be mean or to be punitive. Rules are there to provide guidance, to teach to provide a sense of commonality. What is to be expected here? So most of you, I'm sure, have classroom rules. But if you're wondering how to take this a step further, have at least three simple rules. And here's the key. They have to be positively stated. So, for instance, if your rule is no running, I want to challenge you to say, use walking feet. Because of this age group, their attention and focus to words and the language we use is so critical. So if I say no running, they might have only heard no, or they might have only heard running, the very thing that we don't want. But if we say use walking feet, I'm okay with them catching on those three words. Use, use what? Walking, okay. Walking what? Walking feet. Rules establish order, provide expectations. And this is the exciting part is that when children meet those expectations, we can remind them of, wow, I love how you're using your walking feet. And that promotes a sense of confidence and self-esteem and absolutely safety. These are all opportunities to help grow these things in children. All children need that. All children need those opportunities. Also, kids need adults to be in charge. Now, if you have a conversation with a child, they might tell you a different story. But the truth is that adults need to be in charge. They enforce the rules. And when kids don't know the rules or break the rules, we have to teach them. We have to teach them the right way. Rules whether kids like it or not, help them create a sense of order and calm, even if they break them. So here's an example of um, some classroom rules. Um, They have be safe, be responsible, and be respectful. And then it looks like beneath each one of those, they have some more specific rules. For us... Man, speed limits. It's the one thing I think about because it's the one thing I'm being asked to follow almost every day. Now, the next thing to consider is, what do we do when rules are broken? With children, we have to teach them. We also, this is equally important, we have to offer them time to practice. So, for instance, if, if Johnny continues to run, We have to help teach him to use walking feet, remind him every transition, every time. Remember, we use walking feet. Show him a picture of walking feet. And then we have to practice with him. We're going to use walking feet together. Now, I don't know what your experience was driving, but mine was I had to speed a few times and get pulled over a few times before I realized it's not worth it. I don't want to pay the the speeding ticket. I don't want to have to take stop class. So even though uh, following speed limits is more punitive than anything, I'm a grown-up. I I was able to to take that as a learning experience, that speed limits are there for a reason and they're to be followed. It keeps me safe. It keeps the other drivers on the road safe. And even though at the time, if I was speeding and pulled over, it would not be fun, I still have a deep respect and appreciation for the speed limits and why they're there. All right, emotions. Emotion regulation is so key in in helping organize children and helping prepare them for later on in life. Kids can learn how to be healthy with their feelings. Again, emotions, we just aren't born with understanding them. This is something that they have to learn. And um, we learn by the people that we're around. 
So if we are primarily around caregivers who can talk about their feelings and know what they are and know what to do with them, then that's what I'm going to do. But if my caregivers aren't really certain about their feelings and and don't really know what to do with them when they have them, then that's what I'm going to know also. So we have to take into consideration how can we effectively teach kids about their feelings? Well, first of all, we have to create a space where they can be safe to express their feelings. So for instance, if I get mad, I need to know that you're going to help me and not just punish me. I need to know what to do with my feelings. Okay, so I get mad. Oh, okay, well, um, there is this thing called deep breathing that I can try or there's actually a space in my classroom where I can go and be angry until I feel better. Again, we have to teach emotions. We do this through visuals. We do this through stories. We do this through in vivo as, we, as they have them. We, we, we tell them what they are. We validate them. We say, man, you are mad. I can see that you're mad. It's okay to be mad, but it's not okay to hit. Let's learn a different way. I also want to remind you of this. When feelings come into the mix, things can get quite escalated. But I just want you to remember, feelings are just feelings. They come and they go. I use this analogy that they're like waves in an ocean. Sometimes they come in and they knock us down. We don't even see them coming. Sometimes they're super calm. They, they come and they go and it's no problem at all. But they don't ever last forever. And that's a really, really important thing when we're supporting children with really tough feelings is we have to provide them with hope. This feeling right now is really tough, but it's not going to last forever, and I'm going to help you get through it. So this is just an example of a way to help um, start introducing this idea of feelings to kids. This is a feeling wheel. Um, and parallel to us, um, we figure out all of these ways to express our feelings. We, we reach out, we say them out loud, we write them down, we call a friend. Our ability to articulate is much higher, and so we seek out supports when we need it. And sometimes we don't. But again, remember, this is just a clue, we will oftentimes express and experience our emotions in ways that our caregivers did. Think about that for a moment. It's a very important part of helping navigate what do I do with my feelings. So this is just a list of ways that we can help teach books, stories, visuals, um, Having a calm down corner, a safe spot in the classroom. Um, I have an entire sheet on how to go about doing this if this is something you'd like to do. I think it's a great idea. Role modeling with the kids, discussing your own feelings as they come and go throughout the day. Use live emotions in the classroom. It's taking a moment to pause everything that's happening and say, everyone, we have a friend who's feeling really sad right now. What can we do to help? Um, again, I will discuss towards the end the backpack series, but it's um, little, little notes and articles that talk about how parents can support teaching emotions to children. Validating those emotions. All emotions are okay. That is something that I make very clear to all of the children that I work with. All emotions are okay because we all have all the emotions. It's just some of those things that we do when we have those emotions that aren't okay. And then we practice and talk about replacement skills. Practice, again, being very, very important. If I show you all a video on how to knit and then a week later expect you to knit me a hat, I might be very frustrated with the results. But if, I, if we watch a video on how to knit and then I give you some yarn and say, I'm going to be here with you and we're going to practice doing this together, our results might be a lot better. 
All right, problem solving. Now, I know this because I've been in and out of preschool classrooms forever. Problems always come up, and problems always exist. So kids have to first know what a problem is. When things get hard, when there's not a good solution, when I'm in a fight, it's a problem. We have to help them know that there, there's a way out. There's a way of generating solutions. But how do, we, how do we do that? We have to help them navigate the process of identifying what the problem is, how do I come up with a solution, and then how do I execute that? So visuals and stories, again, are a really great way to help children learn how to problem solve. And real time, real time situations are honestly the best teaching tools. It's, oh no, we have a problem. What are some possible solutions? And you're there with them every step of the way, helping navigate that process. When kids can problem solve effectively, again, it promotes confidence and self-esteem. And now you've just created a template so that next time it happens, they have a better idea of how to manage it. It also promotes regulation because if I know that problems are going to exist, but I know how to navigate it, it's going to help me be so much calmer going into a situation where a problem might arise. And finally, it creates a sense of safety that there is a process to getting an end result where everyone might be okay. So here I have, um, these are the resources that I, um, I actually just got updated versions of all of these. So if you don't have them and want them, please let me know. Um, Tucker the Turtle, it's a really great social story about problem solving, having the problem solving steps. How do I navigate this? And then the solution kit here um, are really, really great skills to help children learn in navigating this, the um, problem solving process. Now for us, this has changed over time. I don't know about you all, but whenever I have like a problem, like so let's say I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I, see, I hear something really funny happening in my car. Um, I, of course, keep driving because why would I stop? And my first thing is I Google funny noise coming from car, right? I want instant access to possible ideas. So Google is not bad. It, it really puts quick information at our fingertips. Um, but I think we also have to remember that um, over time, we have more and more experiences that help us navigate problems later on in life. Transitions. Oh, man. When I, when I start talking to teachers about problem behavior, transitions always come up. So think about transitions for a moment. It's it's the ability to stop what we're doing, reset your focus, possibly move to a different location, and begin engaging in something different. That's a lot. That's a lot of steps in that. Um, so having transition strategies, having things already in mind of how do I support these children going from point A to point B. So I have a handout that I'm going to make sure I, that you all have access to. It just gives some ideas of different ways to help children make transitions smoothly throughout the day. But I like this acronym for MOVE. Model and verbally cue for success. So again, telling children what the steps are, doing it yourself so that, again, you're teaching, you're showing them how to do it. Um, organizing, prepare ahead of time. So again, in five minutes, we're going to go to snack time. In three minutes, we're going to go to snack time. So that way, by the time it's snack time, everyone's already been kind of given the heads up that, oh, yep, it's snack time. That's what's coming next. Having visuals, if needed. Again, going back to routines. What's coming next? I can see it. Okay, it's snack time. I see. And then use excitement. So on the, on the right, you'll see, can you move like a, these are just animal transition cards. We're going from the circle rug to the table. Um, everyone walk like a monkey. Gosh, it's exciting. It's fun. It's novel. It's silly. It gets them engaged in a, in a way 
where moving from point A to point B is now fun and okay, whereas before, maybe it was an opportunity that I bump into my friends, or maybe it's an opportunity where I get lost and I don't know what to do. So I will make sure to get you all the um, the move handout that I have that just has some different ideas on it. So again, transitions, if children know what's to be expected, what's coming next, how do I get there? We're reducing anxiety and we're making it very clear of what to expect. So this is the part where we go back to this idea that um, early childhood mental health is also considering the context of relationship between parent and child. We have to be able to continue to support parents. So think about what you currently do in your roles to support to support this idea of, of parents interacting with their children. Um, oftentimes I hear we have an open door policy. Parents can come into the classroom. We send home monthly newsletters, all of that stuff. Um, but I want to show you. So this is the backpack series that I was talking about. And they are one page little tips. And they encompass addressing behavior, emotions, routines and schedules, social skills. So what I like about this is whatever you're working on in the classroom, there may also be a um, a handout that could be sent home to parents on what they can do to support that at home. So we'll go down um, to one of my favorite ones is, let's see here, the blue ones are emotion. Um, right here, how to plan activities to reduce challenging behavior. Again, gives three or four, five really great tips for parents to try at home and how you might practice this at school. Again, if you send this home and this section is all parents read, awesome. We're getting them something. We're getting them an idea of how they can follow through with supporting children with social emotional development at home. Okay. So um, if you would like the whole um, backpack series, just let me know and I can send them to you in some type of compressed file. That way you have access to all of, um, all of the handouts. So this again is from Dr. Bruce Perry. This is something that I just wanted you to consider. Um, he says that these are the six core strengths for children that's a vaccine against violence. Again, it's if, if children can have these skills, chances are they will turn out good. You know, they'll turn out okay. So attachment, meaning I have the ability to have really good relationships, good bonds and relationships with people. Um, Self-regulation, I can control my impulses. I can control my urges. Um, I'm aware of my feelings. And also, I know what to do with it. Affiliation, again... I am chosen, being able to join and contribute in a group. We are the preschool class, or we are the red table, or um, I am proud of me and my class. Attunement, being aware of others, recognizing the needs and interests and strengths and values of others. I feel like this skill comes in so much when we begin to problem solve. There's a piece in there where you ask, would it be safe? Would it be fair? We're taking into consideration everyone else's perception, and that is supporting in, in um, helping attunement. Tolerance, understanding and accepting differences in others. Not everyone is the same, and that's okay. And then finally, respect. Finding value in differences, appreciating worth in yourself and others. Confidence goes such a long ways in children. Development of self-esteem and confidence. Every single opportunity that we have to be able to praise a child for, for a met rule or um, something kind that they've done, I feel like should really, really be highlighted. 
All right. So I feel like I, I wouldn't have been doing my job if I hadn't have really talked about trauma for a moment in talking about early childhood mental health. So traumatic experiences in childhood or chronic stress alters brain development. When children are placed in situations where they experience chronic stress, the areas of the brain that are responsible for survival um, get really, really strong. And those areas of the brain that are responsible for learning and engagement and relationship aren't very strong at all. And so if children have experienced trauma or chronic stress, they are going to have a harder time in a typical classroom setting. However, if all of the things we talked about above, having a routine, having transition strategies, having visual um, visual materials in the classroom, those are all really, really great ways to combat some of the behaviors that could be presented from a child who has experienced trauma because it reduces, it reduces the, um, the likelihood of unpredictability. It reduces the likelihood of me not knowing what comes next. Um, it, re- it, it reduces the um, probability that I'll get lost in what I'm doing because those things happen to children who have experienced trauma. Um, If this is something that you would like more information on, um, these three authors, Bruce Perry, Dan Siegel, and Bessel van der Kolk, are very, very great resources. Um, Dr. Bruce Perry has several books that are really great reads. Um, Dr. Siegel has a book called The Whole Brain Child that goes a little bit more into that. And then Bessel van der Kolk has a book out called The Body Keeps Score that helps um, really understand the direct correlation between physiological responses and trauma. So this picture that we see here, um, this is helping us know and understand that as a child's brain develops, it it develops from the bottom up. So the very first thing to develop is the survival brain. Again, when nothing else is working or kicking on, that survival brain is going to be working really hard. And then the next thing to develop is the limbic brain, which is responsible for attachment and emotional development. And again, attachment is I have a safe, secure connection with a loved one who gets my needs met, who I can go to. Um, that That is critically important for brain development. And then lastly to develop is the cortical brain, which is responsible for children um, using that when they come to school. Thinking, learning, language, um, inhibition, not having, not acting on impulses. Now, again, to understand trauma a bit more, when kids experience trauma or chronic stress, the primitive brain gets used quite a bit. The limbic brain gets a little wonky. If I don't have secure attachment or something very confusing happened to me and, and I can't make sense of it and my emotions are all over the place, um, that's where those children are going to be at in their brains most of the time. So when you're asking them to come in and learn and think and interact, those things just aren't online in the brain. And that's where it can get frustrating. So thinking about it from a brain development perspective, um, when children who've experienced trauma struggle in the classroom, it makes sense from a biological perspective. But again, going back to their brains being incredibly malleable, by you being able to provide a sense of safety, provide a sense of safe relationship, provide a sense of learning about feelings, provide a sense of of movement free from from ridicule or harassment, Um, you are helping grow those first and second levels of the brain so that they can be present and in that cortical brain in your classroom. So again, those interventions that I talked about before are meeting needs in the primitive brain and the limbic brain so that children can be in their cortical region while they're in your classrooms. So I like this visual. This is from Dr. Bruce Perry also. It breaks down the brain regions. 
And again, brainstem is for survival. The diencephalon is mostly for um, sensory information. It's it's helping us make sense of our environments, what, what's coming in and what we need from our environments. Um, the limbic area, oh, that, that facilitates social emotional growth. Again, such a critical, critical area um, that we focus on when we're looking at early um, childhood mental health. And then that cortex is abstract thought. All of those things needed for school. So I created this in a um, in an attempt to help educators understand the needs of children in these different brain regions. Um, so if I was going to do this in person with you all, we were going to do a game that would help kind of tie this together. But um, I'll just briefly go over this brain-based interventions page to hopefully tie it together a bit more. So again, the red area is the brainstem, responsible for automatic survival reflexes, heart rates, breathing, all of those things. Um, when things get out of control, we can offer support with children to take deep breaths. And again, children aren't going to do this on their own. You have to take deep breaths with them. And if they're not willing to do it, you continue to take deep breaths. Because something happens where um, they have mirror neurons in their brain, and if they sense you're calm, then it's contagious, and then they'll start to calm. And... Um, it's a really effective strategy at helping lower heart rate. Again, if we can help lower heart rate, we help communicate to the green area of the brain that we no longer have to panic. We no longer have to fear. Things are okay. There's someone here with us. Okay? And then also establishing safety. That might be having a verbal conversation about safety. That might be physically showing how a child is safe in your classroom and it might be having conversations about how they stay safe or how they keep their friends safe. Maybe a conversation about rules and why they're important. Um, moving up to the yellow area, this is the diencephalon again, um, working with sensory integration in the brain, um, offering fidget tools, adaptive seating, self-regulation strategies, calm down strategies, chewing tools, organization strategies, um, whether you know it or not, this is stuff that you guys offer every single day. Um, and some kids just me may need more individualized support of getting sensory needs met. Um, the limbic area, again, this is kind of the emotional hub of the brain as well as the, the area of the brain that's constantly scanning for danger. Helps protect us. Um, so offer co-regulation. So this is... Um, when children don't know how or what to do with their feelings, we do it so that they can learn how. Or it's engaging in a strategy with them to help calm them down. Um, I have an entire list of co-regulatory strategies that I'll be sending you um, that are broken down by age group. Um, this next one is so important, being present and calm. Again, kids sense your emotional state and being calm and present is one of the best things that you can do when children are struggling. Um, and then support them with self-regulation. If they have developed the ability to demonstrate I can do deep breaths, then offering and supporting when they can. Again, reassuring safety, um, removing the triggering stimulus if there's something that's happening in the classroom that's upsetting them, um, either uh, removing it or stepping away so that they have the opportunity to calm. Um, naming the feeling or the sensation. Um, there is a theory by Dan Siegel. It's called name it to tame it. If you name the feeling that the child is experiencing, sometimes that's enough to help start the calming process. And then finally up to the cortex um, interventions. So something out there that we talk a lot about is executive functioning skills. So it's inhibitory control, flexible and adaptive thinking, working memory. Um, those are all skills that kids develop, and we have to help them develop those skills. So supporting the development of impulse control, um, having opportunities for them to wait, um, think before they do, offering opportunities for them to have flexible thinking, um, uh, being okay when I tell you no, um, only having one choice, Practice working memory, learning new skills, reading, uh, support problem solving, which we already talked about. Um, and then this last one again, providing positive descriptive praise and encouragement. Kids need to know that they're doing well. 
it is a it is a form of showing love. You are doing well and I need I need I need you to know that you're doing well. So this is a picture that was constructed by Al Merden. He's an artist and I kind of fell in love with it because I see this in in children that I meet with every single day. Um, my interpretation of this is the expectations that's placed on really young children um, these days is very different than what it used to be. Um, and so when we're engaging and interacting with, with kids of all ages, but specifically the younger children, we need to take into account what they're actually capable of doing. Um, what is a child this age actually able to do? What do they need? Not only what can they do, but what do they need at being this age? What is important to them? What can help continue to to fill their brains and fill gaps and and all kinds of things like that. So just take into consideration that um, some children in your classroom may be ready for concepts you present and some may need a lot of practice before they can they can be good at it and be okay with it. All right, so this next piece, collaborate. When things don't go well or when you do feel like you have concern about a child, I would encourage you to collaborate. There's not a worse feeling in the world than being in a classroom and feeling alone or feeling like you have to be the problem solver. You have to know it and figure it out. So I would encourage you to turn to a team to help navigate this. Communicate with other professionals that, that may be available to you. And just remember, it's not all on you to figure out. It's really hard for one person to manage all of the stuff that goes into helping um, problem solve what's going on with a child. So just keep that in mind. So what do you do if you're concerned or need more help? Um, first step is always having a conversation with a parent or guardian because they might have a wealth of knowledge that can fill information gaps or help things make sense. Um, getting the school psychologist involved can be incredibly helpful because they might have ideas, strategies, tips, um, or even if an evaluation is needed, they can provide guidance on that. Um, you can reach out to me if you have questions or concerns. Um, like I said, I, I love offering consultation. Um, it gets me to think outside of the box sometimes, and um, I, I really do like collaborating with teachers. Collect some data. This is so important. Um, in a lot of the meetings that I attend with teachers and parents, the parents are always wanting to know what is going on. So make sure that you're collecting some data in terms of what the intrusive behaviors are, what time of day they're happening, how often they're happening. Um, it's it's tedious at times, but that information at the end can be really helpful. Um, it can it can narrow down some patterns that might be seen. Um, yeah, it can be helpful. Um, and then also, if you have a process in your school for getting children the help that they need, also obviously you'd follow that. Um, and then also support parents in seeking outside supports if needed. One of the most frequently asked questions um, to me this year is, should this child be in counseling? And I don't always know the answer to that. I'm not automatically going to say yes. Um, but if parents and children are needing more support than what they can um, offer at school or get at school, then absolutely we can, we can help parents navigate outside supports because it's intimidating. It's, it's a process. Um, it takes their time and it takes their truly, you know, dedication to getting their child the support that they need that can be incredibly overwhelming and intimidating. So once again, we have to um, form support around parents when we're looking at seeking outside supports. All right. If you want to know more, um, I did a presentation at Winter Work Workshop called just strategies. It's more specific to brain development and the brain-based strategies that I discussed with you. Um, we're going to be working on putting that out as a, as a webinar at some point in time, so you can be looking for that if you want. And email me. I love to hear from you guys. Um, I just get really excited when I can engage with you, whether it's with questions or celebrations or even ideas. You guys are the most creative people that I know. Um, so if you have seen some things that you're interested in creating for your classroom. Um, if you would like consultation, if you have questions, concerns, anything, please let me know. And I would love to support and engage with you at that level. So here are some really helpful resources. Um, all of these are my go-tos, honestly. 
Um, I feel like oftentimes these are are the best, the research based, they're effective tools. Um, so check them out. And if you see something that you like, um, use it. And if you're looking for different things, let me know and I'll see if I can assist you. Well, thank you all so much for um, listening to my presentation. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.